Hi, our first, um, uh, our first public event, which is actually the second day of class. Students are still coming in, also having successfully grappled with our automated attendance system. Greg has uh, asked me to tell you that when you saw an image flash up as you checked in, it's an echo of Jeffrey Gibson's work, whose work we'll be encountering throughout the semester. But <laughs> without, uh, uh, let me back up from the housekeeping to welcome students and community members to our first public lecture in our Thursday series on video art in context. My name is Shannon Jackson. Uh, I'm a professor here at UC Berkeley in rhetoric, theater, dance, and performance studies and various other departments, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. As many of you know, this is a, is somebody doing that on per Oh no, that's just a stretch. <laughs> it's not, a, not an emergency. Uh, the, the, uh, this course is a course that uh, is closed to the public most of the time, and every Thursday opens to the public with an incredibly exciting series of speakers. Um, investigating different aspects of video art, historically, aesthetically, politically, as we go. It is also a course uh, that is uh, an ambitious one because it has a lot of component parts. And in order to pull off all of these um, aspects, I am indebted to our co-teachers, my co-teacher, Greg Niemeyer in the Department of Art Practice, as well as our graduate student instructors, Zihan Liu and Sachi Mulkey. Uh, we're also incredibly indebted to the entire BAM PFA staff, the staff that is recording, publicizing, ushering in order to welcome all of us to this event. And this series and course are entirely indebted, all of us are indebted to uh, the generosity of the Kramlick Art Foundation. This entire course, its speaker series, uh, our teaching assistants, what it means to even welcome our teaching assistants, all of it is uh, funded through a generous donation from uh, Kramlick Art Foundation, a foundation founded by Alum, Cal alumna Pamela Kramlick and her husband expressly to support education and public engagement in the field of video art. This is in fact the second time they have supported a big course like this. The first time was during COVID when I had the privilege of teaching online uh, in spring of 2021 and where somewhat paradoxically but also appropriately we were investigating the screen while also um, being connected solely by the screen during that time of the pandemic. So the screen as an object of attention and as a vehicle for connection was very, very all too pertinent and urgent at the time. So needless to say, we're incredibly thrilled <laughs> to be able to offer a new iteration in person with renewed support from the Kramlick Art Foundation. I hope before I proceed, you could help me in thanking the entire UC Berkeley team and the Kramlick Art Foundation for making this happen. Okay, so here with, I'll share what I hope is, oh, maybe it's not gonna work, my basic plan and right away. Mm, maybe this isn't gonna work after all. Sorry, we've had some workarounds, and we'll start up. Um, I'll tell you. The next slide, right? Yes, just the next slide. There we go. Would you push this one? Yeah, just uh, left. Rather that one. OK, here is my, here is my plan for the day uh, just to set the scene of the entire series, uh, as well as the course with some key concepts and key artists. Also then, uh, in the next part, situating this a uh, hybrid field video art within a range of art histories. And at the, the very end, as a kind of coda, I'll anticipate where we'll go in our series. So video art as a term is the term that we're using for describing our uh, a form, a form that has many component parts and many different kinds of practitioners. As a kind of primer, or set of references, I thought it might be helpful to give you a couple of names that might be a, a little bit more familiar um, to, uh, to those for whom this is a new reform. Some of you may know that uh, director Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen is uh, an Academy Award winning, winning film director who has a, had a great deal of success in um, the, the producing feature films as well as an, uh, the Small Acts Netflix series. 
So he works in the screen in a lot of different ways. And at the same time, uh, though some of you may not know that he began life as a video artist, as somebody who was thinking about the manipulation of screen and sound in various iterations, and often did his first installations or presentations of his work in a museum or gallery context. And in fact, we had the privilege of having him speak in our course two years ago. Uh, I have a reference there as well as the Vimeo recording if you would like to explore more where he talked about his work and then he talked about the relationship between something that might understand it to be video art practice where we might display screens in a gallery setting in an immersive context next to his practice in award-winning cinema uh, um, and the, uh, the display of na narrative feature film. You can go there, and interestingly and loving, uh, wonderfully for us, that exhibition that he was describing happened at Tate Modern in London, a, a very important modern and contemporary art museum, and it was curated by Clara Kim, who happens to be your fellow, uh, fellow alum, a Cal alum and one of our distinguished um, graduates in the art history department who curated that and engaged in a great dialogue. So if you want to explore more, you can go to our own site to find it. Another person that is in the orbit right now, Nan Golden. Nan Golden is a, a, a longtime um, artist, for, for primarily working in the media of photography and in video installation. She's an artist who began working in documenting and turning an artistic spotlight on communities challenged by a range of issues, especially issues um, having to do with sexual violence, she, uh, um, with harassment and battery. She interviewed and worked with sex workers as well as communities that were afflicted by uh, drug addiction. She was challenged throughout um, her career with people saying that she was not actually an artist or that shouldn't be material that is right for, um, uh, it, was, it was maybe newsworthy but not artworthy. Um, but gradually she started to th uh, think more and, and people started to gain more insight um, uh, into what it meant for her to be producing these images, whether as photographs or as multi-screen installations that investigated these really difficult issues. As it turns out, she ended up becoming, in um, unexpected ways, embroiled in some of the issues she was documenting. Uh, she, after a hand injury, she was prescribed Oxycontin, and as um, she recounts later, found herself addicted to it within two days. Many of you may know that Oxycontin is produced by um, a pharmaceutical company owned by the Sackler family. The Sackler family also happens to be one of the largest philanthropic supporters of the arts. All throughout the, the world, and certainly throughout the country, there are lobbies and uh, galleries and artistic initi initiatives made possible by the Sackler family. So Nan Golden found herself in a very difficult situation, in, in, a, in an impurgated situation with the Sacklers, both as someone who might have been the beneficiary on some level of their philanthropic support of the arts and at the same time um, the unwitting uh, victim of, of an apparatus that was selling addictive material. So. Laura Poitras, a documentary filmmaker, challenged Nan to allow herself and her pursuit um, of changing the dynamics around Sackler money to be the subject of a documentary film. And so that film, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, is now out in theaters. Uh, it's already won a bunch of awards and seems to be queued up to re receive more. So it's another place where you would, uh, I invite anyone to go and see that movie to learn more about Nan Golden's practice, as well as the ways in which the deployment around the screen uh, interfaces with a whole variety of social and political issues even what it means for a documentary filmmaker to be working on a video artist, right? So those are a few reference points to have in the back of your mind, but we also wanted to be sure that we were sharing with students and community a longer history of practice and a varied practice, not all of which makes it into the cinema, into the mainstream theaters now. On Tuesday, we shared this image with students, uh, an important early work from Nam Jun Pik who uh, 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 titled, titled this work TV Buddha, 
Some of you who live in San Francisco may have seen the incredible uh, exhibition solely devoted to um, Pike that was curated at San Francisco Museum of Art by Rudolf Freeling, someone who will be speaking in our course. And various iterations of this work happened. When we uh, asked the students uh, to, to tell us a little bit about what they saw here and what they encountered, a lot of very exciting and interesting things came up. People were wondering what it meant to um, what, what that object was that he was looking, that that Buddha was looking at, what it meant to have a Buddha actually um, sitting and kneeling before the screen, what it meant to be mounted in an art, um, in an art context. This, uh, this piece also very early was uh, set up to track the movements of the receiver as the receiver goes to encounter it. So if you, and I'll try to keep, um, so if as you're, Approaching it, uh, your 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 body and movement as you pass it will be, will be recorded um, as passing by on that screen. So the Buddha ends up watching what is behind him. That might not sound like that intriguing of, of a game at the moment, but it is something that at the time, uh, when uh, very uh, people were trying to grapple with what it meant to actually have access to these types of technologies, these kinds of projection technologies, uh, Peck was very interested in using the technologies and turning them into something that wasn't necessarily um, uh, what they were intended for, right? So we'll come back to that piece and to also the histories around it, um, including to why he calls it TV Buddha and why a Buddha might actually even be there um, as a resource. Also, I thought we'll do a little bit more in thinking about terminology and even the decision to call this course video art. Students who will be doing the reading or those for whom this is um, a, a more familiar field know that there are varieties of ways of naming this form or these sets of forms, sometimes called time-based media art sometimes media art, sometimes time-based art in general. Video installation, expanded cinema, video performance will play around with different terms and, 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 and come to and start to wonder why certain terms are used in, in certain ways and what, what the utility of, of different ways of naming the form actually are. One of the huge things and probably one of the most important things about thinking about the form is the ways in which it participates and also differentiates from a whole variety of other art forms. And indeed, as artists who began to start to work with, a, with the camera, work with a port pack video camera early on, were always trying to figure out what the relationship might be between what was for them a newer form and traditional art forms of sculpture, of painting, of photography. So, one of those people who began early on to try to figure out what, what we were doing, what they were doing at the time, was David Anton, himself a hybrid art practitioner, who wrote one of the earliest statements about video art. As students, this is in your syllabus, where David is, uh, Anton, uh, is actually writing at a time when he is head of an art department at the at, uh, university of California, San Diego, one of the many art departments uh, throughout the UC system that actually became pivotal places for experimentation in a whole variety of late 20th century forms. So Anton is sitting there as a teacher and an administrator trying to come to terms with both what this means for artists as well as what it means to be training students who want to start to work in these forms. So you'll see Anton even meditating here on this word video art, saying the name is equivocal, a good name. It leaves open all questions and asks them anyway. Is this an art form, a new genre, an anthology of valued activity conducted in a particular arena defined by display on a cathode ray tube? Cathode ray tubes aren't as familiar to us now, but is that, as, as that, as, uh, is that how to delineate it? The kind of video made by a special class of people artists whose works are exhibited primarily in what is called the art world. Is video art video art only because it's exhibited in those kinds of spaces? Okay, so he starts to meditate about how we even um, think about this term. As he, as he goes and as uh, the field starts to develop, of course, ever more new technologies start to come with it, right? 
So we have early cathode ray tube televisions. We have early port pack video cameras, more on that history later. Um, we have CD-ROMs, we have, start to have VHS. Uh, but over time, more and more technologies uh, start to evolve, and artists who might be welcomed into this um, wide and rangy term around media and video art start to use those technologies as well. So we start to have more and more terms, software art, internet art, digital art, AR and VR are a big dimension of how these new technologies have transformed and expanded what might be inside the category of our course. So we'll stay on top of those things and mindful of those as we go understanding that uh, what is considered new at this moment um, uh, is, is, is perhaps something that might not have been fully anticipated 50 years ago or 70 years ago, but at the same time trying to put ourselves in the place of those who were working 50 years ago and to have that sense of surprise and, uh, and, um, uh, and sense of possibility for things that might feel very normalized and naturalized to us now. I'll go to another critic, somebody who you were assigned to read, students were assigned to read today, Barbara London. Barbara London is one of the earliest curators of video art. She was working at Museum of Modern Art in New York at the time, actually assigned to uh, host films in a screening room, a screening room maybe a little like this one in Museum of Modern Art, and then gradually found herself working with artists who didn't want to show their work in a cinematheque like this. They wanted to show it inside of a gallery. They wanted to set up multiple screens. They wanted spectators to be able to walk around their work, to walk around to different parts of the screen. To, to, uh, and so she began to also try to come to terms with what it meant for these artists to be doing it. And I have a lengthier quote here to, to share that I'll ask you to help unpack with me. So, the critical discourse around video, she says, began with heated conversations among art artists themselves, who for the most part had emerged from the visual arts. But that's important. Critics would sometimes write, video has come of age, forgetting that they had written the same thing a year before. So this was also like, is it here yet, you know? Experimental film largely belonged to cinema studies, an academic discipline that deals with film. Expanded cinema became the term used to describe radical experimentation with the moving image, be it film, video, multimedia, performance, or even immersive environment. Expanded cinema practitioners rejected the conventional one-way relationship between the audience and image, and most opposed, and this is also part of it, commercial films, one-dimensionality. So this was also a resistance to a certain kind of a monetized version of um, screen production. Many experimented with what they considered the physicality of time and space. And this was something that came up on Tuesday as students were starting to realize, even thinking about TV Buddha, how much that is a screen installed. And as such also, there is a spatial and embodied experience um, to the reception of the screen in these moments. So if you think about these terms, I am always interested in trying, when, when Barbara at the time is, say, is uh, testing the limits of certain kinds of art terminology for coming to terms with what she's seeing. So these are some of the phrases that she's using both to compare and contrast the forms that she's using. I always think from a learning perspective, a teacherly perspective, that that habit of compare and contrast, <clears throat> how is this like and unlike something I've seen before, helps you understand what the thing is. So even if we start to take out some of these terms and think about labels for, for thinking about certain forms, we might use them to come back to, say, TV Buddha. How is this like and unlike sculpture? How is this like and unlike cinema? How is this like and unlike television? How is this like and unlike I wasn't going to do this, but how is it like and unlike a game? So if I ask those questions, I wonder if anything starts to occur to you about what, the, what comparisons come forward that seem apt and not apt when you do that. So most of us, when, you, when we speak on Thursdays, are going to take Q&A at the end. 
but because I'm in a teacherly mode, I kind of want to hear from students and from community members and you too. So when, when, we, when you do that exercise, what started to come forward? Anybody who has something to say, can you raise your hand? Okay. There, you do and you do. So what I'm going to ask, oh, Sydney, I, I recognize you even with your mask. I'll have you say your thing and then pass it here. I was thinking that it's kind of similar to a game, but without rules. And I think that a lot of interactive art pieces are similar because there's no like rules. A lot of time art has like, do not touch, but like a lot of times there's like no guidance, no signs. And so you're kind of just like led to interact with it, um, but without like the rules and guidance that is in like, with like paintings or like other games. Oh, I was also going to say that the both movies and this piece of art captures movement, except unlike movies, you yourself can participate in this art because there's a camera that captures you as well. We'll start there, thank you. So imagine, actually, yes, what if there was something set up that actually, and w there are experiments that do this, that, that displayed all of you right now, right? Um, wonderful to get that out, to get out, because it helps us sort of recognize what the conditions are of the traditional cinema. We'll say the unidirectional, the unidirectionality of cinema, of the way that you, you, you were set up now in rows, is mimicked but also um, undone in some way, right? Uh, if we think about it as sculpture, on some level it is participating, as we discussed before, in the tradition of sculpture. It's put up on a plinth too. There is maybe the rule of walking around it. Maybe you're allowed to do that. But as um, Sydney also said, it might be, and somewhat disconcertingly for some, um, a, a, a proposition that, that doesn't tell you immediately how to receive it. There might be insecurity at the moment that people were first began to see this and wondered how they were supposed to, how they were supposed to interact to, with it. It might also be that Pike also wanted to find out how you interacted with it and that the piece became the way in which you interacted with it. The piece transformed by means of the interaction with its receivers, not all of which he could have anticipated. And he might not have anticipated how often this piece gets taught and remounted as well. Okay, great. So let's keep pressing forward, and I'll help. Um, I'll ask you. I'll think a little bit more, a little bit of introduction to more artists that we'll be encountering throughout the semester, including William Kentridge, uh, an artist who will be in residence at Berkeley for um, a lot of the month of March, whose work as a video artist will be displayed at BAM PFA who will also uh, be uh, performing, presenting an opera he's composed at Cal Performances, who will also have a short film series presented in this theater. As in, i.e., this is some, an artist who works across many media, across many forms. Um, often, an artist who also, uh, ha he hails from South Africa, he's part of uh, a collection and history of white South Africans who were very active in the abolition of apartheid. Uh, his father was one of the central lawyers um, defending uh, anti-apartheid activists. And he has that kind of political content um, around human rights, around um, racial violence that he's often uh, uh, engaged with, as well as uh, the history of South Africa. Uh, and at the same time, he's doing it through a many, many different forms of media, even the medium of drawing. He is an avid drawer, and he actually creates what are almost um, uh, video art pieces in the tradition of the flip book, if you know what that is, when a drawing um, slightly changes from image to image, and through the flip, um, you get a sense of a, what, we would now, what we would call a cartoon. He uh, exploits that technology, that time-based medium, turning drawing in some ways into a time-based medium, along with a whole variety of other techniques, film techniques, musical composition, and more. We'll be hearing from him um, in person in March, and uh, 
also, if you want to get a preview, he did speak in our course in spring of 2021. You can access the video to learn more about him. More about him will be coming up. Another artist we're encouraging artists to engage with, Jeffrey Gibson, uh, is a Native American queer artist who works, originally began working mostly in object-based media, which is to say he made paintings, he made sculptures, uh, he makes um, craft and textile installations of various sorts and has gradually begun working more and more in performance and more and more in the medium of video. He has a multi-screen, 10-screen video project engaging with issues of climate change from a perspective of native epistemologies at the Institute for Contemporary Art San Francisco. And we're going to be encouraging students to venture into San Francisco, encounter that work, and also uh, Jeffrey will be coming back to speak in our series. Uh, another artist we're encouraging engagement with, Ragnar Karatsen, is um, an Icelandic artist whose last name is hard for me to pronounce, so I did my best. Uh, who, whose multi-screen installation, The Visitors, is currently on view at SF MoMA, and we've arranged for uh, free tickets for students um, who want to see it. And I'm going to take a risk and get off this screen for a second and see if I can play you just a little bit to give you a sense of what you might be encountering if you go there. This is a piece on multiple screens. That was created when Ragnar and his friends, musician friends, all occupied different rooms of the same old 18th century farmhouse. And together, they're combined in screens to create a kind of choral symphony. Person, but this gives you a tiny sense of the environmental nature of the installation. Right now we're hearing somebody in another screen while viewing this screen, right? So if I just stop there for a second, um, and ask you to think about what a tiny, with a, a be it a tiny little sn snippet of what um, I showed there. Maybe just to hear, first of all, ask yourselves a question of um, what did you see? What did you hear? How did it make you feel? What questions do you have about this entire piece that haven't been answered yet? Okay, so thinking about that, who thinks that they have something to say? We have one hand here, one hand here, anyone? and one hand there. So I'm going to ask you to start, then you, and we'll get it really quickly back to you. Uh, I was wondering, since there seemed to be a pretty continuous music production, yet every single person that we viewed was generating very little, whether there were uh, a, lot, a very, very large number of people involved, or whether they were cheating a little bit and playing some of it uh, on a background track and then just layering over all the things that they were generating individually. I can't, I, we're gonna, I'm only gonna talk when I have the microphones since we're recording, there we go, yeah. Um, personally, it made me feel sort of nostalgic. I like the fact that you mentioned they were in an 18th century farmhouse. Is that what you said? <laughs> like, what a neat place to film this. Yeah, um, made me nostalgic, also calm, considering it f sounded like indie music. Um, also given the fact that it was acoustic, but one of my main takeaways is I enjoyed the fact that they were all in different rooms, but they're all playing the same song. So it's kind of like a unseen, like intangible cohesion amongst them, but what is binding them together is music. Thank you. Okay, can we pass it to you? Sorry, uh, can you raise your hand so people see where the are is? Great, thank you. Um, I feel like the YouTube video that you just showed us of the art piece doesn't really do it justice just because 
obviously like it's a bunch of different videos making like this cohesive song but I feel like I want to know what it would be like to isolate one of the videos and if you would hear like since they're all in the same house like the music that others are playing in the background and kind of how that would sound like with the different videos so I think that's something that like if I were to have the chance to see it in person it would be something like cool to experience. Awesome, so many great points right away there. Both the, que <laughs> the question about whether they're cheating. Um, it's, what? One more. Oh, sorry, great, thank you. Do you have a microphone up there you can pass? Yeah. Okay, cool. So I had a chance to actually see this in person recently at SF MoMA, and one of the things that I don't think is captured by the YouTube video that's really cool about seeing it in person is that it's um, in a very large room. And with every screen, there's an attached speaker that corresponds to what you are seeing on that screen in the room of this 18th century farmhouse. And so what's really great is you are filled with a sense of curiosity when you're in the room, as if you were wandering the house yourself, room by room. Um, and every now and then, you'll hear something. For example, the sound of a cannon being shot off outside reverberate through the other rooms in the house. Or you'll see even the musicians decide to take a break, smoke a cigar, and drink some whiskey with the other musicians in the other room adjacent to them. So it's, it, it, it's a bit of an adventure in how you can express your own curiosity in something that was filmed in a static way if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you, thanks so much. Uh, again, uh, people will have the opportunity to see, see this, all, all, and I encourage everyone to go. But through, if I can just collate some of this initial feedback, um, people are wondering how this was made, um, and also I think that sort of question around cheating, um, around how a sound and image are juxtaposed, how much this is, uh, and a, and a singular event, a moment in time that was executed one time and is redisplayed versus how much tweaking and editing um, goes in. So one starts to ask those kinds of questions. I so appreciate the comment that really focused on music, on sound being an essential connector here in the piece. As later on in the semester in, a, in this unit where we're thinking about video across the arts, we're gonna think deeply about what it is to manipulate sound but also to, to deploy sound and thinking in particular about what the medium of sound or music does that perhaps the me a medium of image doesn't necessarily do or doesn't do in the same way. Um, also, the, the comment about being in co-present space in the house, in the farmhouse, just sort of the nostalgia for being together. More on what it means to be co-present in a minute, but let's recognize that that sense of a spatial experience is again part of what makes video art video art that it's installed spatially and then part of why this comment here about what this video YouTube is missing and that comment there about what the video the YouTube is missing this is documentation that is not this is not the artwork the experience of the artwork is a spatial experience it's a, it's a it's a it's a artwork that was made from space, in space, and it is re-spatialized um, in very strategic ways in order to create a different kind of experience. So when you go, you might be attending to all of those kinds of manipulations. Okay, so important when I show these things to also say, this is not the artwork. You'll go and see it yourself, right? All right, so you already did my pick a form, what's it like and unlike. Uh, I'll, I'm going to go, to one more artist who we are not gonna encounter in person, but we'll hear from about his work when we go to, uh, when Bart Rutten, the uh, a museum director in that, at Central Museum in the Netherlands, who recently curated a show that included Bill Viola, will speak um, about him. And I wanted to do that uh, to also give you a very different sense of one, we'll call it single channel work, that is using different kinds of techniques and also to get your response there to what you see. This is a work um, by Bill called um, The Raft.
usually installed in a gallery, in a museum, in a huge, huge, on a huge, huge screen. Again, I'll ask, what did you see? What did you hear? Oh, sorry, is it going again? Went to some new video. How did it make you feel? What questions do you have about it that you'd like to have answered? Cogitating? Thoughts? Here? Anyone else? There, proximate. Anyone else? Okay, we'll go to these two right here. Thank you. Um, one of the first questions that kind of came to my mind was whether um, the people who were in the video kind of knew what was coming for them. Because at first it looked like they're kind of standing crowded in almost like a bus or like a train car setting. And I could feel almost like that that scenery was happening around them until the water came out of nowhere and I just that like question just pops into my mind whether whether like people who seem like they're in a normal setting know what's going to happen to them <laughs> and I don't know if that's like a question that's essential to watching the piece but it feels like a surprise waiting for you oh excellent next one at first I thought it was acting until the water came and then like the the sound made it sound so it just intensified the video where it almost seemed like a natural disaster. But one of the questions I had was, at first, I wasn't sure if they were acting. So that was one of the questions I had. Mm -hmm. And we might, we might ask, is there anyone else who has? OK, there, comment there. Thank you. Um, I've seen like a Bill Viola, Viola work before. Um, I forgot what it was called, but like there were two figures. One figure was lit on fire and then another figure was getting doused in water. It's the crossing. The crossing, yeah. Um, that definitely reminded me of this because again, people getting doused in water. Um, but my takeaway from it was, it's kind of interesting to see how there's like a group of people, right? But they're all living their own separate lives. But once there's that um, the entrance of water, they're all kind of, put together like they're all experiencing the same tragedy in a sense I don't know what if it is a tragedy or like what the water means but that's what I took from it awesome great so given Zihan's support I, I'll just um, say some say some comments there um, connecting things together first of all people want to know how was this made right um, did, are people acting did they know it was coming even if they knew it was coming, <laughs> how much could they have um, anticipated what its effect would be on them? But also, what I hear all three of you doing is, is, is working for something like a narrative, some kind of sense of story or reference or placing it into, say, using the word tragedy or um, um, catastrophe for understanding what has happened so interesting then to think about what it might mean to have this piece stand metaphorically for other bigger things right that it might be a bus stop um, but it also that it the sense that all of these people have these individual trajectories they're looking at their phones they're by themselves they're individually doing things and on their own path and then when this water comes suddenly they become part of a community unwittingly unexpectedly and that some, and that, that that moment, there's something that suddenly they all share. 
So we might even think metaphorically about what that means, this sort of very simple, albeit <laughs> intense experience and what it starts to stand for um, in our minds and in our hearts. Okay, we can, what about slow motion? Yeah, any, I mean, any thoughts about that? Okay, I'll just ask the question, ask you to think about what the manipulation or the use of slow motion just generally does. Of, of since we are talking about a so-called time-based medium, that technical manipulation of time is something to think about. But I will press ahead. Um, and also uh, invoke one of these other terms that I introduced because time-based media art is a wonkier term, it's a complicated term, but it is an another term that is often used to describe this category and it helps us think about all kinds of um, uh, key words and vocabularies that might um, help us understand what we're seeing when we drill down a little further. And as students know, on Tuesday I shared with them a set of key words that are going to be constantly recurring throughout the, the semester and I invite community members to think about these terms as well so that we don't take them for granted. This is a course in the arts and design series that it works on um, forms that often get called time-based media, that it comes from um, genealogies of performance, that they're often dealing with social and political issues, whether it's what, what might be signaled around equality and equity. Um, and I'm gonna talk a bit more also about some of these other terms such as concept and con um, conceptual art practice that informs this. But to catch people up, and also because I always think it's a good to retread just a little bit, I'll share a little bit about what students who were thinking about synonyms for the art, for art, the word art, or arts, started to come up with on Tuesday. I asked them just to think about these two words. And by the way, the word, I think when you use the word art, sometimes it's different synonyms come up than if you use the word arts, right? But people used words like this, um, expression and communication, influence, experience, emotion. They were thinking about the, the grand, grand impact of the arts. Uh, one person used the word practice, which to me brings in a different set of associations around um, repetition, around um, be getting good at something, um, around a constellation of behaviors over time. A person at the end used the word story, and I found myself using the word story when I was trying to come to terms with um, the responses to Bill Viola, and we talked for a little bit about whether all art forms are always deploying story whether there's implied stories or explicit stories, whether narrative is always there and or what happens when something like a narrative or story is repressed in some way. And then I had students also start to think about specific art forms, just the difference between dance or music or film or drawing or painting in part because as you saw from my lead up here, I think if we, if we understand the traditional art forms from which um, um, artists are drawing, then we also understand their experiments too. So I, we thought a bit about painting, but also recognize that painting is not one thing, that sometimes it looks referential and representational and sometimes um, abstracted. Uh, that paintings, um, as well as sculptures, are often delivered inside of a gallery, which is different from the delivery system we're in right now. Um, that sculpture is one of those things that might become under the visual art, but again, sculpture is not one thing. Uh, and that there are various challenges to this, um, to what it means to make and to receive this three-dimensional form. We talked about theater and the delivery system of theater. We talked about dance and all varieties of dance. What happens when we think about um, the Ragnar piece, The Visitors, in a genealogy of theater or in a genealogy with music? Okay, how is it like or unlike what it is to experience a, p a p piece of music? Here, we're thinking about film, and you might be looking in the mirror right now. This is a cinematech, and what it means to um, encounter a screen from your seat in, in rows um, versus what it might mean to be in a gallery, what it means to be in a theater versus a different kind of theater. Here's a black box theater, that all of these different spatial experiences become different delivery, different modes of delivering the artwork, but arguably also par are part and parcel of the artwork. The artwork changes in terms of its medium um, by virtue of the space in which it's housed. 
We also just talked about story and this very traditional way of encountering stories and even what it means to hold a story as an object and what it means to turn pages. Even, even this act of turning pages, you could say, is a time-based medium that matches, you could say, the, the, the sequential way that narratives unfold. Turn the page to find out what's happening. It's not the only way we encounter stories, obviously, anymore, but just to also think about that medium. Then um, here's poetry, thinking about that as well. And then here's a piece I didn't share that I just sort of think is a, a, maybe an interesting one to, to share after going through all of these fairly traditional ways of dividing up art forms. And then to ask what you make of this one. This is from Lawrence Wiener. Um, Lawrence Wiener is an artist who is known in, in many ways for creating language pieces. Language pieces usually on walls, sometimes outside, sometimes inside. He actually um, has uh, done a piece for our own art wall at the Berkeley Art Museum. So when you see this piece, I'll ask you what you see and how it makes you feel and what questions you have of it. And I'll tell you, actually, when I've taught this piece before, one of the first things the student said is, this is mildly annoying, this piece. So you're allowed to say that, too. OK, anyone have some thoughts? What is, is it like or unlike painting? Like or unlike a poster? Like or unlike a mural? Like or unlike a poem? OK, we have some thoughts here. And there, and who, does anyone else have their hand up? Okay, great. I think initially I was reminded of um, what I've recently learned to be graffiti poetry. Mm -hmm. um, even though it's, it's like not necessarily what most people would think to be a poem, but like at the same time, poetry is such a broad medium that like, yeah, it could be poetry. Mm -hmm. And it, it, the way that it's like tilted, it looks like maybe it might not belong there, which is like graffiti. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think it's kind of like, it calls attention to itself in that yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely, I think even just noticing that it's tilted, or here's another version of a Lawrence Wiener piece, that it's, a, it's an unexpected arrangement of text. So, which says, ask me what, I'm, what I am. It's calling attention to itself and asking questions of itself. Yes, thank you. Well, it's, a, assuming it's painted, it's a painting, right? And there assuming that it's painted on a wall, it's definitionally a mural. So, it's at least those two things, right? And, okay, so if it's a mural, what, it, what makes it like and unlike other murals we might have encountered? And we don't have, it doesn't have to be on you to answer that. Um, yeah, here. here, Sion. Sion, thanks so much for your help. Um, I'm not sure if this is like directly relevant to the mural aspect, but for me, it just kind of reminded me of like, um, when you're on like a Google Doc or something and you're trying to line up uh, maybe like different text boxes and stuff <sighs> like that. And it's really frustrating because like they're overlapping and uh, like the line spacing is different and just sort of like that frustration uh, was kind of encompassed in this piece for me. Um, and also, yeah, the tilting and everything as well. Awesome. Awesome. For some reason, I just flashed on, you know, uh, making an image for social media and putting text on the side or just that it, very interestingly, your experience of the layered layered interaction in a Google Doc on your screen is something you're bringing now to the three and four dimensional experience of space. So look how things come full circle. OK, awesome. So interesting to think about and to, and to, and to mine. I think that part of what um, I'm only trying to get out is what happens when we find an artist uh, mixing media in different ways or mixing the traditions of different art forms in the creation of a singular piece. That this is not video art, 
but I would say it, it's, um, it is the kind of, it is an, an uh, index of the kind of ferment and experimentation across media that in which video art emerged. Uh, so um, we'll come back to that as well as to others. I'll also remind students very briefly about the fact that we thought deeply about design and about how design is not always understood to be the same as the arts, that the functionality of design, the external rather than internal motivation, craft, architecture, we often give different names to things under design that are so often solving certain problems, solving solutions, um, it, 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 coming up with solutions to certain kinds of puzzles, whereas sometimes we give credit to the arts for, for refusing to solve, solve those puzzles or refusing pure functionality. And then there's a lot of work that is challenging that polarization. We'll also, um, we al I also had students think about time, and in those synonyms people came up with really fun, interesting, varied thoughts about once we really think about time and don't take it for granted. One student talked about a synonym for efficiency. Another student was thinking about memory. Completely different set of associations, but relevant for this field, both of them. About history, about transformation, and about how you know that a thing has transformed. How do you know a thing has changed? Um, and, and the dependence of something like temporality for, un, for even tracking something like transformation. Scheduling. But even philosophically and politically, what it is that we think that we can hold on to time, that we can manage time, that we're spending some of it or saving some of it or not having enough of it. That's a whole, um, uh, uh, you could say, a, a, a social agreement that we have, that we've agreed to follow a clock, that we've agreed um, to manage our time, but that in some ways we're also participating in a sociological act when we're thinking about the management of duration. Um, I also, um, I'm always a big etymology person, and so I put up these definitions just to have us, um, to some degree, they're obvious and tautological, but also to, to have them in our heads as we proceed, including this notion of a non-spatial continuum measured in terms of events that succeed each other. So obvious, but also just to decide what makes why, why the ref reference to non-spatiality? What is it, um, um, what's the importance of doing that? And what does it mean to be measuring time? And why do we think that time is a thing to be measured? So I thought about different ways that we have of kind of noting time, recording time, in part to think about how artists start to make time not only a thing that their work um, endures or that we endures, but something that they are manipulating as well. Now also this term media, I had students think about this, and there again I'm going to go straight to some etymology uh, uh, in order to recognize that we're going to be, there's so many associations to this term media, and we're going to be thinking about it all throughout the semester. Um, but two big ones, one might have to do with something like mass communication, about what it is to be working in the media, whether we, we might have referred to something like mass media in the, in the 20th century, we refer to something like social media, perhaps more often in the 21st century. We might have think about broadcast technologies versus um, streaming technologies, but that whole apparatus, that large-scale global apparatus for um, sharing content, for charging um, prices for access to content is one thing. And then this very simple plural of medium, which sounds pretty unhelpful, but it's also a way of signaling the way that medium is, a, is an art term, that it is also about the manipulation of materials, of the manipulation of text, the manipulation of screen and, um, 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 and sound, that those are the media in which artists work. Um, and that this sense and this wider, occasion, uh, wider sense of um, how the notion of a broadcast um, mass media um, sense of the term coincides or doesn't with an art sense of the term is something that we're also going to be thinking about. Students know that one of my favorites is number two, medium as the intervening substance through which impressions and ideas are conveyed. So, all that I was asking you to do in asking, in asking for the responses to those artworks um, or to think about these art forms is to try to identify what that intervening substance is, in part so we understand what happens when people start to manipulate those substances in unexpected ways. 
As it turns out, David Anton, the guy that I was um, quoting earlier, also thought about this juxtaposition quite a bit. And when he was trying to come to terms with what video art is, he identified at the time two major discourses. One, a kind of enthusiastic, welcoming prose peppered with fragments of communication theory and McLuhan-esque media talk. The other, a rather nervous attempt to locate the unique properties of the medium. Discourse one could be called cyberscat, and discourse two, because it engages the issues that pass for formalism, could be called the formalist rap. I'll also call it the art rap, right? So McLuhan, Marshall McLuhan, was a communication theorist in the 60s or 70s, was one of the, one of the major figures for identifying what it meant to have broadcast technology unifying the world. He came up with terms like the global village um, or the medium is the message in order to understand that at that time, it, as the late 20th century was proceeding, we had all new ways of communicating with a whole different set of mediums and with worlds and peoples throughout the world that we de didn't have before. So that's the, Martian, that's the McLuhan esque sense of media. Next to, this is a guy who's a department chair in an art department, who's an artist himself, who's working with all of these other artists. He's trying to defend or understand the formal properties of this medium. What art, what, what, where does this even fit? Um, so this is my way of signaling and adding a little color, <laughs> literally, to differentiating two discourses that we're gonna be tracking and whose relationship we're gonna be tracking um, throughout. The, the formalist rap next to the cyber scat rap. All right, so I've already, I'm al already starting to place all of this into what I would call art histories, but reckon reckoning with the fact that these forms are engaging with various art histories. So I wanted to touch um, on a few different points um, and bring up a few different um, thinkers that are on this, our syllabus um, that we'll be engaging with throughout the semester. We've already dealt with David Anton, and I already talked about going way back to 1975, but we're gonna go further back, and we'll go further back to um, uh, a, an earlier, earlier figure. Oh, that, that, that date is wrong. It's actually 1766. An 18th century thinker, Gertrude Lessing, Lessing um, um, as well as a few others. I'm gonna start with Gertrude Lessing just to tell you a little bit more about um, how I think this early thinker, an early thinker about the arts and aesthetics might even be oddly relevant. Some of students are, are um, reading him. I showed this sculpture before and there was a reason I was um, showing it. This is a sculpture of the Lawakawan. Uh, the Lawakawan historically is known as a Trojan priest. He is given credit in certain tellings for actually having anticipated the Trojan horse, that the Trojan horse was in fact, um, and, and letting the news out that the, that the Trojan horse would um, be, um, um, would, um, uh, would explode and um, varieties of uh, secreted soldiers would emerge and um, emerge victorious during the Trojan War battle. Um, he, one of the, one of the big moments um, in his chronicle is a chronicle around the gods uh, releasing serpents to come and kill Luakawan and his two sons. Now, this story has um, a very, a fairly prominent place in a major epic poem by Virgil called the Aeneid. Has anyone heard of the Aeneid? Okay, a few in terms of, yeah. So this is in terms of classic Western cultural, classic Western cultural history. This along with Aristotle, Plato, Virgil, these might be part of what a, um, a, a Western early classical um, um, uh, Sophocles, these are some of the people, um, men writing poetically, writing epic poetry about the key, um, the key myths, the key traditions, the key stories of a culture. So the Aeneid is an epic poem, we call it, uh, one that wouldn't have been transmitted through print, that wasn't there yet, but usually transmitted through an epic poet um, um, telling a chronicle um, using Virgil's beautiful poetry. So what starts to happen um, for some of these philosophers who are trying to come to terms with uh, the difference and relationship amongst different art forms is that they alight upon the Lawakawan and compare and contrast what it means to represent 
this in sculpture versus in a poem, in an epic poem. And that's the subject that you see vetted throughout the Lawakawan in your syllabus. You'll see Goethe Lessing quoting a fellow German who is also trying to come to terms with the effect of that sculpture, saying things like, this Greek spirit is portrayed in the countenance of Luakowan. Even under the most violent suffering, the pain discovers itself in every muscle and sinew of his body and the beholder, whilst looking at the agonized contraction of the stomach, without viewing the fact and the other, uh, and the other parts, sorry, believes that he almost feels the pain himself. This pain expresses itself without any violence, both in the features and the whole posture. He raises no terrible shriek, such as Virgil makes Lewakwin utter. Okay, we can start right there. Some people heard the screams in Bill Viola's um, The Raft, right? That is something that that medium can do, is do the shriek or have a simulation of the sh shriek. Can this medium do that shriek? Or how is a, something like a shriek implied? Um, the pain of the, um, uh, ver uh, uh, the opening of the mouth does not admit it. The pain of the body and the grandeur of soul are, as it were, weighed out and distributed with equal strength and through a whole frame of the figure. So this is uh, somebody writing about art, and you can disagree or agree with how Winkelmann responds to this. But it is also an attempt to say how a sculptor, how somebody working in marble can do the work of conveying so much but to do it in a form that is received, you could say, all at once. In one moment, we start to encounter it. Yes, we walk around it, um, but that it also has, it's, it's, a static, it's a static piece, right? And so, that, so if there's a story there, it's something that has to be implied without, use, without access to time or a temporal form for doing that storytelling. These dynamics between so-called painting and poetry, or sculpture and literature, um, between space and time, the static and the durational, are what you see uh, Lessing trying to work out throughout that essay. And it's part of what I was already trying to get you to think about. Of course, they're thinking about this long before anything like the camera was invented. Um, but, the, but where coming to terms and thinking deeply about what a so-called static form is and what a so-called durational form is, is um, a part of what becomes helpful, I think, in coming to terms with our forms, the forms that we'll be studying. Here you see Lessing saying, if, if it is true that painting and poetry in their imitations make use of entirely different means or symbols, and you can decide if you agree with this, the first, namely a form and color in space, the second of articulated sounds in time, if these symbols indisputably require a suitable relation to the thing symbolized, then it is clear that symbols arranged in juxtaposition can only express subjects of which the wholes or parts exist in juxtaposition, while consecutive symbols can only express subjects of which wholes or parts are, just, are themselves consecutive. That's a mouthful, okay? but it's why I have this dyad juxtapositive wi juxtaposition with consecutive. If you think about what it is to assemble elements to express something, what he is suggesting is that a painting, or we can also say a sculptor, is juxtaposing these elements in a composition all at once, and that a poet, or we can say um, a novelist, or down the road, a filmmaker, is using a consecutive meeting, me medium, a successive medium. Now, whether or not these proper departments can only do certain things is certainly a question. And whether you agree with that, okay, this, this medium can only do this and this medium is assigned to do that, we might be challenging all of that throughout. But once again, I think it's important to understand the history of thinking about the dis difference amongst different media in order to understand what it means to start to mix them or challenge their conventions. All right, so I'll proceed a little further and you might even think about what it means to use a consecutive medium, a successive medium such as text, in a juxtapositive space. Uh-huh, okay, that's part of what might be challenged here. And you might use this to also try to understand what Bill Viola is um, uh, how he's carrying forward these um, distinctions amongst media, but also how he's challenging them. 
And I'll say a little something about Walter Benjamin. We'll advance forward in thinking about um, an, uh, a, a German philosopher from the early 20th century uh, who is uh, one of the foremost um, philosophers for grappling with, at the time, a range of things. He's writing in the midst of technological revolution. He's writing in the midst of world wars. He's reckoning with um, racial hatred, with religious intolerance of those wars, and what it is to actually even have something like a world war. Um, uh, uh, and he's also somebody who thinks then deeply about the social and political role of the arts. There's lots of interesting thinking about what the relationship needfully be um, for the artist during these challenging social times. And somebody who's thought, thought deeply about how new technologies, then new technologies, were changing the nature of the arts, but also just the nature of what it meant to be, what it was to be a citizen in society. So we're reading uh, a couple of times, we'll return to it throughout the semester, his signature essay, Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction where mechanical reproduction is now become um, a possibility that starts to challenge um, theretofore um, um, uh, 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 inherited conceptions of art as a one-of-a-kind, by-hand um, artifact. So what happens when art can be mechanically reproduced? So he's thinking here in this quote first about lithography, about what it is to write, and how the printing press changed the nature of text and writing once it could be reproduced and distributed. So he's saying here, um, but only a few decades after its invention, lithography was surpassed by photography. For the first time in the process of pictorial reproduction, photography freed the hand, the painterly hand, of the most important functions, um, which henceforth devolved upon the eye looking into the lens. Since the eye perceives more swiftly than the hand can draw. Think about that. Putting up the camera versus drawing what you see, right? The eye, this lens, can perceive more swiftly, the eye uh, powered by this lens, can see more swiftly um, than the hand can draw. The process of pictorial reproduction was accelerated so enormously so that it could keep pace with speech. We'll see if we th what we think about that. But what it means to actually start to think about even speech as a medium that starts to challenge and um, challenge a pictorial representation to create something new, to create something that would keep up with my, the, the rapidity with which I can speak or narrate something, um, or render a, render an image. Further, this notion of the uniqueness of the work of art, which frankly we still hang on to. We still put artistic signatures on certain artworks saying that this hails from a singular person, a singular artistic genius, is challenged by the capacity, we'll say the capacity to copy. The uniqueness of a work of art is inseparable from its being embedded in the fabric of tradition. This tradition itself is thoroughly alive and extremely changeable. An analysis of art in the age of mechanical reproduction must do justice to these relationships, for they lead us to an all-important insight. For the first time in world history, mechanical reproduction emancipated the work of art from its parasitic dependence on ritual. To an ever greater degree, the work of art reproduced becomes the work of art designed for reproducibility. Okay, I'll linger on that for a second here. When you think about um, what it means in terms of the challenge of the authenticity and uniqueness of the work of art, but also starting to create a situation where because the artwork is reproducible, something that can be um, um, received in multiple contexts, perhaps in a book, perhaps now, of course, on a phone, um, that it starts to become less dependent upon what he calls ritual. And that use of the word parasitic, or the translator's use of the word parasitic, it sounds, make, makes it sound negative. But in general, what he's talking about is, is the dependence usually on, the, uh, on gathering, on in-person gathering, in shared time and space, as the context for receiving the artwork. And once it can be re reproduced, and think about all the ways it's reproduced now that he wasn't anticipating, 
um, that we've lost our sense of connection to that primary experience of ritual. Okay, so that becomes, I think, um, uh, both something that he is again identifying in 1925, but something whose course you might consider tracking um, far afield. Think about how often the work of art reproduced becomes the work of art designed for reproducibility. Think about how many times we set up things um, for our cameras, <laughs> for our smartphone fo fo phones, or think about even starting to encounter museums or performances or whatever where you get the sense that actually it's an, there's, a, there's an invitation to reproduce. In fact, please put this out on Instagram um, because uh, that sense of its reproducibility and circulation is part, it's become part and parcel of the experience of the artwork, right? So he's identifying it then, and we might think all throughout about all of the different ways that it starts to um, uh, challenge and extend far beyond it. I'll come back later to this very lengthy quote, um, but it is what I guess I'll take in, take in the middle is that about two thirds of the way down is he's thinking about you know the good and the bad of mechanical reproducibility and how this copying and circulation um, uh, has you know certain kinds of effects in terms of the absence of ritual, but it also connects us to the globe. We, as he says, calmly and adventurously go traveling. So once again, thinking about how these forms, because of the fact of copying and reproducibility, uh, enable us to travel, whether that be psychically, globally, across regions, across different contexts, and feel ourselves to be connected to people that we weren't, didn't feel ourselves connected to before. This, that, I would say arguably, is also part of what TV Buddha was about that he, that um, Pike at the time is reckoning with what it is to inhabit a global village and what it means actually to start to go traveling through the medium of the screen. All right, so I'll um, close by referencing a final um, author who I will think about um, more deeply in over the course of the next two weeks, Lucy Lepard, who is coming to terms with what she calls conceptual art practice in the, um, in the late 60s. And I'm only gonna say two things about, um, about this, ab about uh, two takeaways about what she, um, what she was doing. But first of all, the context, it's 60s and 70s. It's a very intense political context. It was intense here in Berkeley. It's still intense here at Berkeley. Um, and it, it's a time of, of civil rights, of feminist movements, um, of, of, of uh, protests around the Vietnam War. There is a great deal of political ferment, and a lot of that is also informing um, how artists start to reposition their work and start to have a critical stance about how they might use their work for, um, to engage with this critical content, but also start to think about art itself. Like, how do we even know that art exists? Or how, and start to challenge some of the, um, some of the inherited uh, assumptions about the behaviors in these proper departments. So two takeaways that are important from Lucy Lepard that, uh, that I'll just put out now is the notion that conceptual art starts to focus less and less on the virtuosic deployment of paint or of perfection of that muscle and sinew in the marble and more and more on the idea and sometimes even the idea of art. Um, uh, one comment, I think it was Sydney who said that the Lawrence Wiener piece is, uh, I, I forget how you said it, but something like reflecting on itself or challenging itself or asking you to call attention to itself. You could say that Lawrence Wiener is in some ways, maybe he's a mural, but maybe he's also saying, is this art or is it not art? And asking us to think, do we know it's art because it's on a wall? But what if I put it to the side? It's lit like it should, you know, does that make it art? You know, um, I'm putting my signature on it like a, yeah, I'll, I'll say it's a Lawrence Wiener piece, does that make it art? That type of idea of focusing on the idea of art and, the, and, and getting, grok, grokking the idea was part of what the challenge to the receiver was during that time, as well as the notion of conceptual art turning less and less from object making to action in the sense both of turning to time turning to behaviors and getting off the plinth 
uh, and into the social world, coming off the frame, off the wall, and, and appearing in embodied forms. And also action in the sense of activism, that engaging with a wider social and political world. So I'll talk more at, as things go on about the use of these terms. Uh, Marcel Duchamp is often considered one of the earliest progenitors of something like conceptual art. He famously put a latrine, or we'll say it's a urinal, inside of a museum in part to challenge people's perceptions of what they thought the art, art world was. Is this art because I say it is? Um, and more and more artists all throughout the late 20th century began, or often plotted within that geneolo uh, genealogy, including here's another Lawrence Wiener piece. More and more artists start to in engage with um, uh, social and political issues around race, around gender, um, around um, 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 predation, around human rights. And interestingly, in turning to those social issues, they also start to turn to more temporal forms, to things that might get called performance art, um, uh, social practice, um, a variety of things that starts to take place out in the world, outside of the museum, um, in order to challenge even what we understand the object of art to be, as well as to advance what the political possibilities of art might be. All of that is informing this wide and rangy practices around time-based media art. So lots more to come, um, and lots more escape attempts um, that will be to invoke uh, Lucy Lepard's title um, that we'll be um, coming, coming to terms with throughout. I'll just very briefly tell you how what's coming ahead. Over the next se the semester, we're focusing on, in three units, loosely delineated units, where we're thinking about video in relationship to many art forms, with yours truly, with Greg Niemeyer next week, thinking more deeply about film and cinema, Bart Rutten coming in and zooming in to talk to us about painting in relationship to video art, Ken Bueno thinking about sound and music, and Nick Kay thinking also about performance and also improvisation of the video medi medium itself. We'll go more deeply into a second unit in the middle of the semester thinking about video's place in social and political engagement. Not that those weren't before, but we're gonna go deeply in thinking we're gonna have w William Kentridge, the South African artist um, who I um, previewed. We're gonna have Jeffrey Gibson, the uh, native queer artist who I previewed, who is on site at ICASF right now. Lynn Hirschman, who thinks deeply about gender and about the politics of technology. Um, and our curators here at BAM PFA, Julie Rodriguez Woodholm, Susan Oxtoby, Kate McKay, are all putting together exhibitions that will be supporting this course that we'll get to engage with and hear from. And finally, we'll be focused on the idea of circulation, just thinking in general about what it means for these forms to be circulating, what it means to buy them, collect them, what it means to preserve them, what it means actually that the form of the copy, the capacity to copy is both essential to this medium, essential to its production, and also something that people fear about it. People fear um, uh, about being unwittingly documented or about getting a copy that isn't um, original or authenticated. So we'll talk about those politics as well. So yeah, lots ahead. I will say, just in closing, that as much as we are speaking here and we'll be exploring video art and video art installation, the points that were raised here about the need to see it in person are still very relevant. And so I think it starts to become a real challenge also to that proposition from, William, from Walter Benjamin about whether or not the dependence on ritual, whether we still have that, the dependence on co-present um, occupation of space um, might still be something that this form needs. And I will say that after all of the challenges too of the last um, several years and the continued challenge of creating healthy environments for gathering, um, as much as we're be, be thinking about video and screen as a principle of connection, um, I'm a deep believer still in the synergies that happen in co-present gathering in space. I'm so thrilled that you're committing to gathering with us. I look forward to gathering again and again, ritualistically again and learning from each other. So thank you for your attention today.